Our medical and public policy panel includes Dr. Beth Rosenberg, a fellow in the American Car College of Cardiology, board certified in both cardiology and internal medicine. She holds a master, uh, medical degree from the Medical College of Pennsylvania and a doctorate in education and exercise physiology from West Virginia University. She's had a private clinical practice in Chapel Hill for 20 years, where her interests include treatment and prevention of heart failure, hypertension, preventative cardiology, and exercise in health disease. Dr. Nathan Boucher, who is on her left, is a researcher and author, Veterans Affairs, Medical Center, Duke University, Geriatric Education Research and Clinical Center. Dr. Boucher assesses patients' experiences and expectations of the healthcare delivery during advanced illness and near the end of life. He has a particular interest in cultural attunement of health services including religious and spiritual considerations and how this affects the quality of the healthcare delivery. To his left is Dr. Warren Kinghorn, Associate Research Professor of Psychiatry and Pastoral and Moral Theology, holding a combined chair with Duke Divinity and Duke's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He explores ways in which theology and philosophy might constructively inform Christian engagement with modern medicine and psychiatry. Dr. Donald Taylor, professor in the St Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke, an associate professor in the School of Nursing, as well as community and family medicine at Duke. His expertise is in health policy, healthcare reform, health economics, health insurance, hospice care, long-term care, medical care access, and elder care. And on the extreme left, your right, Mary Price, Pricey Harrison, who has just won re-election to the North Carolina State House of Representatives. <laughs> She represents the 57th District and has represented them since 2005, covering Guilford County and her native Greensboro. She holds a BA from Duke, a law degree from UNC Chapel Hill, and she is a retired communications attorney. Their biographies are all in your handouts. Dr. Rosenberg, would you please start our discussion? Okay, thank you, Mary Kay. So as Mary Kay mentioned, I'm a cardiologist. I've been in private practice for 18 years. And today I'm speaking from my personal experiences, which are not necessarily shared by other cardiologists or uh, physicians or medical providers in general. I'd like to point out that I take care of a lot of older patients, and one of my subspecialties is heart failure, so I take care of a lot of patients with heart failure. I believe very strongly as I care for these patients in establishing partnerships with them. I evaluate, I diagnose, I recommend, I prescribe, I support, and I care for my patients. Throughout our partnership, I think it's really important to provide those patients with the opportunities to choose the route that they want to go. I often explain to patients that we as cardiologists have many ways of torturing them. Really. However, my goal is not to torture them. My goal is to facilitate the best quality of life possible for each individual patient. And when that is not possible, my wish is for them to go to sleep one night and not wake up in the morning. I've had that happen to two patients in 18 years. I've had many, many more who I've seen struggle with difficult decisions, struggle with end-of-life issues, struggle with progressive uh, heart failure and other cardiac issues uh, for which I think they might have gladly accepted the option of assisted suicide. 
So I find myself more and more often, as I deal with my older patients, I have a lot of nonagenarians now, dealing with end-of-life issues. Respect, support, dignity, and choice are all integral aspects of my approach to caring for these patients. Advanced directives, crucial, not nearly enough, are willing to go that route. Communication with your physicians and a good relationship with them, a trusting relationship. Communication with family and caregivers, also crucial. There must be ways to guarantee that the choices patients make are honored and supported. I think Barbara pointed out very poignantly that that's not always the case. And I have seen that happen in more than one of my patients and many of my friends who have dealt with this in their loved ones. I'm not sure why in our state of North Carolina physicians may attend, no, no, they must attend and often assist with deaths. But that's okay. They're dealing with murderers and rapists and criminals. So in our state, it's okay to assist, physician-assisted death, as long as it's for the execution of someone who is considered a criminal. But it's not okay to assist when someone chooses death at the end of a terminal progressive illness. About three months ago, a patient that I share with another physician in my part, that I shared with another physician in my practice, was suffering greatly from progressive metastatic esophageal cancer that had been diagnosed three months before. One afternoon, he told his wife that he was going out to the porch to get some fresh air. This was in November, I believe. She cautioned him, it's chilly out there, so don't stay out too long. Five minutes later, a gunshot, gunshot rang out. He was successful. Both my colleague and I would have gladly helped this gentleman, which would have helped his wife and his family. And that's all I have to say. Dr. Boucher. Thank you. A reporter asked me what I thought about this forum, and I used the word jazzed. I am jazzed to be here. Um, and the reason for that is because a public forum for such uh, emotional, contentious um, issue is just, it's the way to go. It's, that's why I love this country. Um, so that, that's just a neat thing. So thank you for coming, first and foremost. Um, first thing I want to say is that um, hospice and palliative care, and there's probably varying degrees of understanding of, of those terms and what they mean in this room, hospice and palliative care need to be applied more frequently and effectively. And then in some cases, thank you. In some cases where symptoms cannot be controlled well enough, and that's by the patient's standards, not the physician's, and where there is a perceived loss of dignity and autonomy, and that perception is valuable. Physician-assisted suicide could play a useful role. The Patient Self-Determination Act of 1991, a federal congressional act, while not listing physician-assisted suicide, and while being posted in every Medicare, Medicaid-receiving facility um, in the United States, there is evidence there that there's strong federal interest in patients self-determination and maintaining that patient self-determination through healthcare proxy designation, advanced care planning. A patient's self-determination in death and dying is within the core of the Constitution's guarantees of privacy and liberty. A well-written physician-assisted suicide law puts in place protections for physicians assisting in the end of suffering for terminally ill patients and creates a stepwise process for it to happen. A well-written law mitigates many of the abuses opponents indicate, such as who administers the drug, the effect on vulnerable populations, or a patient's capacity to make that decision, or decisions at all. 
Denying a patient exit from a terminal disease in the face of great suffering is not merciful or humane. First do no harm can apply to helping a patient find ultimate relief from pain and suffering through death. What about the slippery slope arguments? I've not actually heard slippery slope yet, um, which is really weird. Um, so I'll say it. Oregon and Washington data indicate that the majority of people are white, educated men, not the vulnerable persons detractors of the law profess. A smaller number of persons who get the prescription actually follow through. It is a choice that can be abandoned. In 2015, Oregon had 132 deaths out of 218 prescriptions that were written. That means that there about 60% chose to go through with the process. And in 2014, it was 67% and again, 60% in 2013. The concerns reported um, in Oregon by the Department of Health for uh, those utilizing the uh, Death with Dignity Act of 1997 uh, range from losing autonomy, decreasing ability to participate in activities that make life enjoyable, loss of dignity, losing control of bodily functions, burden on others, inadequate pain control, and financial implications of the treatment that they were receiving. While not an adequate driver of decision-making and end-of-life care in the case of physician-assisted suicide, allowing a patient to take their own life in an organized and sanctioned manner removes further high-cost, often futile, treatments and undesired care. While punishments for assisting another to take their own life in other states include murder, manslaughter, felony charges resulting in imprisonment, fines, loss of a license if it's a, a provider who's providing the assistance. The, the law in North Carolina doesn't prohibit physicians from assisting a patient in taking their own life explicitly. However, a physician-assisted suicide law would more clearly protect a physician if they chose to participate. My final comment is this. First, first, we need to have better pain control in institutions and in our communities. Then we need to have earlier referral and use of hospice and palliative care. These processes along with better education about and use of advanced directives will take good care of most terminally ill patients and for those suffer whose suffering is too great by their own assessment should have a law, we should have a law in place to protect physicians and their patients in an assisted suicide process. Thank you. Dr. Kinghorn. Thank you. It's easy in debates over policy to forget that behind statistics are real human stories that are often complicated and often tragic and often beautiful. So I'm grateful to Barbara for sharing your story. I know that yours isn't the only story in the room. Get to the mic, please. Can you hear me? Is this on? As a, as a psychiatrist and theologian, though, I want to say at the outset that I hope very much that North Carolina never enacts a law like Oregon's Death with Dignity Act, and I want to briefly give three reasons. First, when physicians prescribe lethal doses of medications to patients with the intent of providing them the means to end their lives, in my opinion, it gets the very heart of doctoring wrong. It subtly erodes the social trust that we all place in our physicians. I agree that doctors should promote relief from suffering. Relieving suffering is a core part of what good healthcare providers do. But relief of suffering is not the only good of medicine, nor is it a good that trumps all other goods. Even that is appropriate limits. In North Carolina, doctors do not relieve suffering by actively killing our patients. In the last 10 years, I don't, we haven't even been participating in executions. In North Carolina, although we used to, we no longer relieve the suffering of intellectually disabled women by forcing sterilizations to prevent their suffering and the suffering of their future children. We shouldn't be doing these things because to be a good doctor is not to relieve suffering at all costs, but rather to walk alongside human beings as those who are on a journey, seeking to relieve pain and suffering when possible, 
but always seeking primarily the health and flourishing of the body at every stage of life, including in its final stage, as death approaches. Physicians are to promote life, not death. Not life at all costs, not the kind of life that's propped up by technology, but the life that is the integrity and flourishing of the body. You can't seek a body's health by killing that body. Second, as a psychiatrist, I'm concerned about the way that mental illness will inevitably complicate decisions about physician aid in dying. Unlike in Europe, where euthanasia and assisted suicide for psychiatric disorders are permitted, I respect that Oregon's law doesn't allow mental illness to be an indication for uh, death with dignity and recommends that anyone suspected to have impaired judgment from mental illness to be referred for counseling. But from the published statistics, it's unclear how this is working on the ground. Of the 218 patients who were prescribed lethal medication in Oregon in 2015, only five, or 2.2%, were referred for counseling. That's an interesting number because about, at any given time, about 5% of our overall population meets criteria for depression. So what's actually happening in Oregon? It's unlikely that terminally ill patients requesting lethal medication are less depressed than the general population. So there are really two options. It could be that physicians in Oregon are doing an exceptionally good job weeding out people with depression and other mental illness before prescribing this medication. But if this is true, it's remarkable how few patients, having received that counseling, actually then request and receive the medication. Or I think more likely it's possible that many of these 218 patients were depressed, and yet they're evaluating physicians, at least one of whom wrote 27 lethal prescriptions last year, attributed their sadness, lack of energy, and desire to die to their medical illness rather than to any mental illness. And we don't know because those numbers aren't collected. They're not adequately reported. But I, I know as someone who works in mental health that the boundaries of what counts as mental illness are broad and slippery. And evaluating for impaired judgment is often very subjective. And it'll never be possible to cleanly implement a death with dignity law that doesn't in some way spill over to the suffering associated with mental illness. And this leads to my third point, which is that embracing physician-assisted death as a culture exalts control and devalues vulnerability, and therefore subtly devalues those who are most vulnerable in our society. It's striking, as others have said, that most patients who died in Oregon last year were concerned not by inadequate pain control, which can usually be managed with good hospice and palliative care almost always, but rather loss of dignity and losing autonomy. Maybe it's just coincidence, but in this respect, I can't help but notice that both the states that were among the earliest to adopt death with dignity laws, and even more, the people that have made use of Oregon's law since its inception, and I might even add th this room tonight, are overwhelmingly white. The very people who've been taught all of our lives, and I speak as a white man, that it's good to be in control, that you should not be vulnerable, that you should be the master of your environment and your culture, are those who are more likely to choose both physician-aided death and suicide in general when vulnerability and loss of control become an unchangeable fact of life. But this need to be in control, to maintain autonomy, not to be a burden to anyone else, is a social pathology. Because the flip side is that when, you're not in, when you are not in control, when you are a burden, maybe you should just get out of the way. It pathologically equates dignity with decorum and control rather than with being a human. I worry less about laws like Oregon's leading to mass euthanasia campaigns and more about the subtle pressure that it places on people who were taught that their worth depends on their not being a burden and who now are burdens to justify their ongoing existence. Choice can curtail freedom as well as expand it. So if any of you were to invite me to dinner tomorrow night, I would gain the option to join you, but I would lose the option to avoid spending three hours with you and not to have to tell you that or to justify my decision. In the same way, and more seriously, people who are, uh, are facing the end of life um, could gain the option for an additional form of death, but lose the option to go on living without having to justify their ongoing existence, at least to themselves. I don't want to live in a culture where anyone, however vulnerable, loses the simple freedom to stay alive without having to justify his or her existence. Thank you. Dr. Taylor. Hey, uh, 
the thing that I do in my job as a professor at Duke that I like the most is teaching undergrads intro to U.S. health system, so basic health policy. And Barbara, I start it, the first thing I say to them is exactly what you said. The only thing everybody in this room will do inevitably is die. But this is to 18 and 19 year old kids. <laughs> and um, for most of them, that, that wasn't what they were dreaming about hearing <laughs> first out of the professor's mouth with health policy. Um, but most of my research is in hospice and palliative care and long-term care. So. Um, I understand, to, to me, the only way to understand all of health policy is from the inevitability of death and trying to understand the things that we do to forestall death and, and extend life. Um, and, and obviously the fact that each of us will die means that at some point it stops working, right? So we have to figure out how to navigate that. And so I think Nathan said, man, I'm glad we're talking about this. This is a bumpy conversation, but our culture is really bad at talking about hard things. So um, I, I think that's a, a, a good thing about this forum, um, you know, period, regardless. I wrote down just five points that I'm just going to say and then tell you whether I think they're true or false. And, and, and they're just um, basic ideas. I realize it's late in the day. Um, if we had better caring hospice palliative care options, then no one would desire assisted death or physician assisted suicide. For many years I said that. Um, I think it's probably false that no one would desire it, but it, it's already been said. There, there's, there are great crises in this country of not providing adequate systems of palliative care and hospice. And most of the research that I've been working on, we're trying to improve this, but that, that's a great need. Second, um, assisted death or physician assisted suicide or death with dignity laws are not the most important end of life policy issue. And, and to me, I think that's undoubtedly true. And part of that um, is based in, in the simple numbers that we've talked about. I, I, I think whoever gave the, the statistics in Oregon, I think, said 1,585 people have uh, chosen to, and, and actually ended their lives in Oregon since 1997. And I did just a quick back of the envelope calculation. About 600,000 people have died in Oregon since 1997. So it's an incredibly small number. Um, and, and I should have said from the beginning, I, I'm quite ambivalent personally about uh, this law. I, I'm very uncertain. And when I say that, I mean I see aspects of, of, of both sides. Um, but my, my experience as a researcher in particular is when there's something that's really rare, there's something really unusual going on there. Um, and so it's part of, it's the rarity I think gives some people comfort. The rarity actually gives me some of the most concern uh, that, I, that I have. Um, fourth point, there's research evidence that patients and families want more of what I would call high-touch, low-tech options near the end of life. Um, so this is definitely true. We, we did a study at Duke where we em, en, enrolled Medicare beneficiaries who had advanced cancer and their loved ones, and we asked them what was important to them. And we further gave them a tricky scenario. We said, if you couldn't have everything that the Medicare benefit package covers, what would you pick? What's most important to you? We further made it even more difficult by adding options that aren't now provided. And about half of these folks, these are people who are very, very ill, so it's not a theoretical discussion for them, were saying they would be willing to walk away from what we might think of as last line chemos that are very expensive, have very bad, difficult side effects, and very low probability of success in return, for example, for flexible cash to hire someone to come help their mother get in and out of bed or to um, g give their mother or their father lunch so they could be able to still work a job, which they would need to do. So um, there, there's a great need, I think, for more flexibility um, in, in how um, people who are facing death um, consume, essentially, their Medicare retirement. And I've now said Medicare um, you know, two or three times. You know, the plain reality is last year in the U.S., 83% of the people who died were Medicare beneficiaries. And, you know, it's not very surprising. You have a, an insurance program that picks people up when they're 65 and carries them until death. So, um, it, you know, in the end, um, end of life medical policy is, is first and foremost, you know, Medicare policy. Um, then this final thing is something I really believe is true and, and is, is something that we really don't talk about much, although it's been hinted at today. Um, you know, the lack of a coherent plus patient-centered long-term care financing system in this country 
is the most important public policy is is really the most important public policy issue that almost no one talks about. Um, and so um, it's, um, in my ambivalence, my biggest fear is that the noise of the conversation around this will crowd out the discussion of these other issues. But um, at the same time, after being here, maybe the noise of this will draw people and uh, help us have a broader discussion. That, that would be a hope for me. Representative Harrison. Thank you. Um, and if Ed will and, and the rest of you will indulge me for one second. The reason why I'm unopposed, I mean, the reason why I'm reelected is because, and the reason why, why my constituents are stuck with me another two years is I, I was unopposed. That's because we have terribly gerrymandered districts in our state, and we've got to fix that or we'll never have good policy on any issue. So um, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Ed and team, for pulling together an incredible discussion this afternoon. I have learned a ton, and I, um, it's, been a, it's been a great discussion. So, so I have to say I'm intimidated to be on this panel and follow the other panel of experts. I stumbled into this issue. I um, had buried my husband. He had an unpleasant encounter with lung cancer. And about 15 years later, my sister had a brain tumor. And it happened to be the same year as uh, How to Die in Oregon came out. It and screened at full frame and uh, got me thinking about this issue. And I thought about it and I just, you know, should we do something like this in North Carolina? I know my sister would have benefited. I know my husband would have benefited. And others I'd known who had died agonizing deaths might have benefited from this. So I, I didn't really do anything about it. But then I, um, the Brittany Maynard case and all the attention, that it brought to the legislation as it was being debated in California, um, I just decided to take the plunge and put the bill in the hopper so that Susan Fisher, actually I should give her credit, Susan Fisher from Asheville and I filed it together. We had several co-sponsors, including Greg Meyer, who's from Orange County. And um, we wanted mostly to get the conversation going, which is what has happened. I um, know that we didn't really have time to formulate a bill that factored in every specific um, or conforms to what might be more specific problems in North Carolina. We simply based it on Oregon's um, legislation. At that point, Cal California had not passed. So we, um, we just took what Oregon had. We thought that there were adequate precautions placed in the Oregon legislation. It looks like California found more that um, we might be able to include in ours. It seemed like this is, as um, has been pointed out, has been taken advantage of by very small number of people. And um, from our perspective, it was about choice and it was about ending suffering. And um, as liberal as I am, I've got a strong libertarian streak where I want government out of my life where it shouldn't be. And this is one where I'm sort of thinking, you know, should they be weighing in here? So I think that um, what, what I've learned today is it, it's, it's a much more complex issue than I thought it was um, when I filed the bill. I um, understand that there are considerations that are very important that we ought to be thinking about if we proceed down this path here in North Carolina. I um, don't expect that to happen anytime soon for those of you who are not excited about the legislation and for those of you who are, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, one of the um, problems of being a very liberal Democrat in a very red state now is that none of my bills move at all. So. Um, <laughs> We, we're, we didn't even get a hearing, so, um, I, but I do, I do have bipartisan support. I just wasn't aggressive about recruiting Republicans to go on the bill with me because it was bill deadline and we just didn't have time. But I think that um, this is an issue I will want to continue to pursue because I just think it ought to be an option um, for those who want it. And um, I kind of feel strongly about that. And uh, I know we've heard a lot of, of thoughtful points have been made today that we will certainly take back with us to the legislature as we continue to pursue this, um, provided we have the momentum for it. I think this is a great start. I, I love that we have this really mixed opinions about it today, and I hope that we continue to have these conversations where we hear, we hear from all sides, because this is, um, this is a big step to take for our state, and uh, we want to do it in a thoughtful way. So I'm grateful for the huge turnout today. Carolina's tip-off is one hour and seven minutes, so <laughs> I want to uh, <laughs> make sure we get plenty of time in for questions, so I'll shut up now and just thank everyone for coming and everyone for organizing it.